Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel Lau. I'm the director of membership for RNAO. It's so great to have everybody joining this working together to support authentic indigenous partnerships between the Indigenous Nurses Association and the Registered Nurses Association. Um, I'm going to uh, start by uh, giving a very high-level brief introduction of uh, RNAO. So the next few slides talks about who we are and what we do. Uh, so RNAO influences, uh, informs, advocates, connects, protects, inspires our mission. Is someone advancing the slide? Our, our mission is to foster knowledge-based both quality work environment, deliver excellent professional development, and advance healthy public policy to improve health. We promote the full participation of present and future registered nurse, nurses, nurse practitioners, and nursing students in improving health and shaping and delivering healthcare services. Our values are we believe health is a resource for everyday living and health care is a right. We respect human dignity and are committed to inclusivity, equity, social justice, democracy, and terrorism. We value leadership in all nursing roles across all sectors in order to advance individual and collective health. And through collective leadership, we collaborate with we collaborate with nurses, and organizations, and to advance healthy public. Uh, the next slide is about RNAO. What ends? Uh, for those who are familiar with a policy governance model, and in plain language, is a special type goal that sets the results for which an organization exists. So there are four ends uh, that the board has put together. Number one is with RNs, NPs, and nursing students to stimulate membership. Number two is to advance the role, image of nurses. Number three is to put on emerging. Number four, to influence healthy public policy. Uh, so now to uh, Lynn Ann Mulrooney. Hi there, everybody. My name is Lynn Ann Mulrooney. I work as the senior policy analyst. Um, and a lot of the work that I have the pleasure of doing for RNAO is on the social determinants of health and health equity. So just to follow up um, from what Daniel was saying about RNAO working to advance health, health care, and nursing, we have some examples on the slide of how in RNAO's work to promote the social determinants of health and health equity, we can't help but the huge disparities and inequities um, among the Indigenous communities. So over the last number of years, at every opportunity, um, RNAO has been trying to reinforce the, the asks and the calls for action by Indigenous communities in Ontario. Um, so sometimes we do this through action alerts, sometimes we do it through letters, um, and often we do it through our formal submissions. So just as an example, when we did a written submission to the Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment, um, it was, a, it was a, a brief that had to do with ending sexual violence and harassment for a healthier Ontario. But our very first recommendation um, was what had to do with echoing recommendations by the Native Women's Association of Canada. So, if, so what we try and do as much as possible is reinforce what the Indigenous groups, communities, and leadership are saying are, are their priorities. Um, so on the next slide, um, it's, it, at 
the 2016 annual general meeting. Um, we were so privileged to have a special keynote presentation um, that was looking at challenges and opportunities linked to the health and well-being of Ontario's First Nations people. So um, we started the day with a documentary um, that featured nurse practitioner May Cat um, and the work that she's been doing um, with the Aboriginal Indigenous youth in, in Northern Ontario. And it ended with a formal signing of intent between RNAO and the Ontario Regional Chief Isidore Day. Um, and so, again, we take opportunities wherever we can, such as in our most recent uh, Ontario pre-budget put out in January to reinforce the calls for action on the social determinants of health that were identified as priorities by um, the Chiefs of Ontario. So while we have started a little way down the journey, um, RNAO is so appreciative of this chance um, to work with Sina and have this opportunity to listen and learn more about working together to support Indigenous partnerships. So with that, I'm really delighted to go ahead and introduce our two very special uh, guest speakers. Um, Dr. Bernice Downey is a woman of OG Cree and Celtic heritage, a mother and a grandmother. She is a medical anthropologist with research interests in health, health literacy, and traditional knowledge and health system reform for Indigenous populations. Bernice is a lecturer with the Faculty of Social Science Indigenous Studies Program at McMaster University. She is also a registered nurse and is currently appointed as the Regional Aboriginal Cancer Lead for the Toronto Central Regional Cancer Program. Um, Bernice is currently a postdoctoral fellow with the McMaster Research Office and the School of Graduate Studies and leading the development of a McMaster Indigenous Research Institute. Bernice's professional experience includes sole proprietor of her consulting company, Minoagin, Good Health Consulting, Chief Executive Officer of the National Aboriginal Health Organization, Executive Director of the Aboriginal Nurses Association of Canada, Associate Director and Research Associate and Special Advisor of the Well Living House, uh, which is at the Center for Research on Inner City Health at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. Um, she's an experienced administrator, facilitator, and an organizational, an organizational and systemic change agent. She is also a lifelong advocate to work towards addressing the serious health inequities among Indigenous populations in Canada. And um, the other person I have the deep pleasure um, to introduce is Dr. Lisa Burke Bearskin. Um, Dr. Burke Bearskin is a member of Treaty 6 Beaver Lake Cree Nation in Northern Alberta. Associate Professor and New Investigator with Thompson River University School of Nursing. Over the years, she has worked in many capacities as a licensed practical nurse and then a registered nurse. She began her teaching career working with Maskawi Community in partnership with Northwest College in Alberta um, before heading north to Iqaluit, Nunavut, where she taught in the first Arctic nursing program. Over the next decade, Lisa worked at the University of Alberta Faculty of Nursing, where she developed and delivered Indigenous nursing initiatives. Lisa recognizes the rights of First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people's health, and to that end works towards enhancing people's understanding of Indigenous health. Under the guidance of, sorry, under the guidance of Indigenous nursing knowledge holders, leaders, and healers, her research interest lies within Indigenous access to care services for Indigenous people. Her expertise and research program is focused on creating sustainable Indigenous nurse-led programs 
that provide a network of professionals to create, exchange, and mobilize Indigenous knowledge in their local settings. Currently, as the President of the Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association, she provides leadership that enhances understanding of Indigenous nursing knowledge based on Indigenous social determinants of health. Lisa's focus on Indigenous wellness includes maintaining cultural integrity in both clients and nurses in support of Indigenous sovereignty as outlined by the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So we're greatly honoured now to turn it over to Lisa and Bernice. Um, so everyone, I just want to let you know, um, this is Josephine from RNAO, just to give you a bit of uh, technical house rules. Um, I'm going to unmute the teleconference line now so that we could have um, Lisa speak. So I would need everyone to please mute their own line so that we don't have as much disruption. And if you are on the phone line and you're also inside the webinar, please turn off your computer speakers because that might cause some feedback. The conference has been unmuted. Le mode discrétion a été enlevé de la conférence. Hi, Lisa, Good morning. Are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay. Good morning, and thanks for that introduction. Um, and I just want to start off with acknowledging the traditional territories of uh, where we each work and the importance of recognizing how important the environment is to our overall health and wellness. And um, considering it, it's very timely that we all acknowledge that uh, we're rooted within our specific regions and the traditional territories of the people that we work with. Um, so um, I'll just go right into the PowerPoint, uh, just giving a brief overview of SENA and what <coughs> SENA has been doing, a bit of history, and then go in. Um, leading up where Bernice will take over um, to, talk, to talk specifically about um, how we aim to try to reach out to our regional bodies now and try to come up with ideas and ways of working together so that we can sustain um, this being an Indigenous organization um, over the years. As most of uh, some of you may or may not know, um, SENA is, um, represents nurses from across the country. You see the map there, recognizing that we're representing the aim of our work is to support the health and well-being of First Nations Inuit Métis across the country, and that um, our nurses work in a lot of these uh, different various regions. Um, so I already ex ex talked about the objectives for today. The vision of SENA is to be a leading expert in this area of Indigenous nursing knowledge and how that translates to practice. Our mission, as I mentioned, is working and supporting nurses within the community specific aim of recruiting, retention, mentorship, consultation, um, education, practice, and research. Um, historically, um, our organization uh, was uh, founded by Jean Goodwill. Um, I think this statement back um, in 1975 captures still some of the things that we as an Indigenous nursing organization are, are struggling with. And this vision of speaking and working together um, is vitally important. This was 40 years ago as it is today. So I want to recognize her hard work in um, sustaining um, Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association over the centuries, over the decades, I should say. And so we have progressed from those original pictures where we were um, uh, supporting the healthcare system to now in 2015, really uh, setting up leadership, and that is a result of a lot of the work that our Indigenous nurses are doing in research, and particularly the story of Indigenous nurses on how hard they've had to work to fit within a healthcare system. And I think it's very timely in our in our media and some of the current research coming out 
um, Dr. Janet Smiley and Lindsay Crowshoe in, in BC, and research project that I work with in uh, Alberta, looking at um, the care of First Nations, Inuit, Métis people. And I think the statement that struck for me yesterday was that I don't think that nurses intentionally go out to work and um, deliver unsafe care. I think there's a sense of um, uh, I, I, the intention of the unintentional impacts of um, racism and discrimination in our healthcare system. So that's been one of the overriding visions of ACCNA is to address some of these issues. And so we're building our capacity um, across Canada. Uh, currently, one of the research, um, University of Saskatchewan took, took a look at the community health um, data that was coming out. and so. Nurses were self-identifying, and so we have close to 9,000 self-identified Indigenous nurses across Canada. As you can see, that's still not quite equity, so we still have a lot of work to do in supporting Indigenous nurses within each of these regional um, areas and moving, helping them move from an advisory capacity to actually um, Indigenous-led um, practice. The research shows that there's a huge significant impact when when we have that, those practicing nurses with those lived experiences and that understanding of our history and the impact that that has on care. Um, and so SENA over the last five years has really continued to develop its mentorship network, <coughs> focusing on recruitment and retention um, with the youth mentorship project, working with OHTN on an HIV project. Um, so we are consistently sought after for our expertise, um, and I think one of the challenges that we've faced over the last few years is how do we continue to respond to all of these needs um, when we're a nonprofit organization, and so trying to really develop a stronger business model, so um, hence the development of our collaborative Indigenous partnership strategy. And so we wanting to really hear from the members about what is it um, that we can do to really strengthen our approach? Um, some things that we need to look at is, you know, equity. How do we achieve equity for Indigenous nurses within our healthcare system? We're not a big organization. Membership funds will not sustain SENA organization over the years, so it's going to take some really hard conversations and discussions over the next little while to really articulate what that looks like. And so in response to achieving equity um, as a result of the truth and reconciliation, our response to these calls are really grounded in, you know, what does reconciliation look like? What does decolonization mean? And how do we begin to integrate um, within widely throughout the healthcare system? And so one of the questions we've asked our nurses and, you know, consistently try to ask other nurses is, you know, what does reconciliation mean to you? There's a definite shift happening in Canadian society as a result of the TRC, which I'm hoping most of you have heard about. I'll please read some of the slides. Um, so this, I'll just leave this question with you, and maybe you can put some answers in the chat box so we can um, speak some of those. It'd be important to really understand how, how reconciliation impacts our practice. So as, um, as a result of these calls to action, uh, we know that the Supreme Court of Canada mandated um, the government to really look at what was happening with people coming forward um, with um, stories of abuse and um, genocide within our cult national culture, uh, traditional territories across the country. So the Commission done extensive work over a number of years, holding national events, gathering stories, and now the University of Manitoba has now housed um, all of these documents, so uh, developing a very strong research center looking at the impact of, you know, this intergenerational trauma and how that um, influences our care within communities, and so how do we take that understanding of trauma-informed care um, and overlay it um, within our own practice, our standards of practice. And I think about standards of practice, and I'd, 
you know, in looking at standards of practice across Canada, there's very few provinces that actually have any kind of statements um, acknowledging uh, Indigenous um, peoples and the history and the socioeconomic status of our of our community. So this legacy of residential school has uh, continues to have um, an impact um, that we're seeing. I think that's what we're seeing. The suicide in our northern community, in our communities, is really a symptom of of the system, um, which really needs to, you know, a lot of our focus needs to be brought to that attention so that we can start trying to dismantle some of the systemic issues that we're seeing. Um, you know, I think this slide here that that shows the legacy of residential school is, is very powerful. And so when we compare it to World War I or we compare it to um, what the kids in general Canadian society have been educated on, we, we well, it's well known that um, every school system has some um, patient on the Holocaust and the impact that had. But when we look at the history of Indigenous people, there's a, been a huge void in that education. So um, it's important that very timely that we take up this work as nurses. Um, you know, when you look at education and what social work is doing, they're far advanced than what nurses have been able to achieve. And so I think we really have a lot to learn from our colleagues in social work and education on how they've been able to address and integrate Indigenous ways of knowing within within the system, within practice, within the communities. And so this, um, so we know that there's this huge intergenerational impact, and I just spoke briefly about that. The 94 calls to action um, are very <coughs> lengthy, and I think we're just really starting to uncover a lot of that work. So SENA has really, uh, the board of directors um, has really advanced our approach and an area of where we want to go and it's really looking at access to traditional wellness practices. And so then the other one, which is one of the reasons we reached out to our regions is, you know, how do we how do we integrate this mandatory training in health education? Um, and who, you know, what does that look like when that um, when that all falls um, into our practice areas? So Hence the question, what does recreation have to do with nursing? And I think specifically addressing that call to action on mandatory <coughs> education um, is really important to acknowledging the truths of the Indigenous nurses across Canada. There's been, you know, lots of evidence to show that Indigenous nurses, you know, are, are fairly invisible within the healthcare system. We know that the health disparities are are widening. We know research has been previously based on mine mining, and we know that there's many barriers still to accessing nursing education, even with the equity seats that we have in place um, now. Um, there's more inequities growing as a result of those inequities. So in this post-era, I don't even like to call it post-era because I think we're in the area of TRC. So for each of us to really um, think broadly about this ongoing process and these meaningful, respectful relationships that we have with all members of Canadian society. I, you know, I think it's clear that it's no longer just an Indigenous issue. Um, this is a collective issue and we have an opportunity to um, rewrite history and do a better job in nursing education. Um, and we have UNDRIP and um, which is our founding document for SENA that we're trying to articulate what this authentic Indigenous partnership looks like. Um, so I'm not sure if we wanted to um, break at this point and have people ask a few questions about, um, you know, what does reconciliation mean to you or what does it have to do with nursing um, and how do we approach it. This is the it would be a good segue um, for anybody if they have any comments or questions up to now before I turn it over to Bernice um, to cover the partnership framework. Residential schools. It's quite interesting, and, and you see a lot of this. 
Well, you ask them, like, the substance. Is that a, am I hearing a question? Okay. So if no one on the line has anything to say at this point, I'll just read out a comment that we received in the webinar um, from a student participant. Um, she says, we need courses that focus on the cultural competencies and care. As a student, even though I have a greater interest in this area or to do practice in this area, I do not have the means to train well to provide competent care. I need more training. Yes, and I, you know, I just respond to that. I think it's really important that we start looking at the language we're using, right? Um, and I try to... Um, Athena has been a strong advocate for cultural safety work, um, and so encouraging nurses to really think more about safe practice as a competency. Competencies are individual markers for an individual, but I think when we look at healthcare and our relationships with First Nations people, cultural safety brings much more substance to the discussion. Um, and Athena developed a framework with um, Core, six core competencies that can easily be integrated into all schools of nursing. In a research study we did a couple years ago looking at which schools of nursing um, were utilizing our framework to integrate those competencies, it was quite alarming um, that I think it was like less than 30% of the schools of nursing even were aware of our cultural safety framework, which is a really good document because it even helps students when you look at, you know, your practice. So how do you address, right, um, respect? And what does respect mean? And, you know, communicating with Indigenous families and members and, you know, how do you look at, how do you address that competency of Indigenous histories and creation stories and grounding that work in that. So I'll refer people to our SENA Culturally Safe Framework. It's for every school of nursing. That was developed in partnership with COSIN and CNA. And um, I think if people start with that, that gives them a really good starting point uh, to start really looking at what those, how those competencies could be applied across the board. Thank you, Lisa. So you might have answered this partially or in full, um, but another question from a participant. They asked, as a non-Indigenous nurse, how can I be more conscious of reconciliation in my practice with patients and with Indigenous nurses? I have an inmate here who that's um, that's a very good question, and again, I think it really begins with um, self. It begins with self reflection. So really looking back at your own practice and your own understanding, right? So it does require because this this education has not been integrated within our school systems, even in our nursing school systems, there's a really lack of understanding. So. Um, agencies and organizations need to create opportunities like this uh, for people to come together and hear this history. So I think we're just at that juncture now, and I encourage again, you know, Cena has a lot to offer, and uh, we can really help with that education um, and really understanding trauma-informed care and how that impacts not only the patient when they come into into the unit or to the floor, but you yourself, what is your relationship? How have you, you know, what biases do you hold? What stereotypes have guided your practice, right? I know there's an old stereotype about not looking at Indigenous people in the eye, and I think we've taught about that in nursing schools. And so that is important to understand that that practice was really something that stemmed from residential schools. Students we um, were afraid to look at people in the eye because and that might have put a target on their back. So, so we really need to dismantle some of these um, discussions we've had on, on how to work effectively with Indigenous people traditionally because it's always come from an anthropologic perspective, right, when we look at culture and nursing. So now that we have a critical mass of Indigenous nurses who have this experience, 
you know, part of the answer is is creating opportunities for them to to advance this and share their knowledge in that. And there's no easy answer. I guess that's what I'll finish off on before I'll let Bernice go. There's, there's no easy answers. There's no checklist on this. And I think, you know, the importance of relational ethics when we talk about ethical practice, right? Um, that's a really important area to, to look at for our own, own um, practice standards. And they're so appreciative, right? And that'll be so neat to go to the fly-in reserves. And okay. Um, Bernice, do you, are you ready to take over? Yes, hello. Can you hear me okay? Oh, can you hear? Okay, um, so I just want to um, acknowledge that I can hear somebody talking in the background. Um, so just a reminder to mute your lines. Um, yeah, so I couldn't, I couldn't hear a lot of what Lisa was saying there at the last slide. Anyhow, um, I would, yeah, I, I can still hear people talking. I don't know if others can. Yeah, uh, Bernice, I could I can mute the line again, and that way it will only be you speaking. Oh, that will be less distracting for me. <laughs> yeah, just give me one second. Okay, thank you. The conference um, has been muted. La conférence a été mise en mode discrétion. Okay. Go ahead. So, Okay, thank you very much. So um, I would like to formally start by um, saying Ani and Chi Miigwech for um, inviting myself and Lisa to um, this webinar to talk about these, these uh, various issues. Um, and I'd like to think it, about it in a broader context of uh, reconciliation-based collaboration in nursing as well. Um, and I, I think it's, um, critically important to acknowledge the champions in this work. Uh, we're very appreciative of RNAO's efforts to look at inequities in health for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Uh, we have many champions and partners that we've worked with over the years, and so I do acknowledge um, their work, and this is an amazing opportunity because the essence of reconciliation um, is to you know, continue the conversation, to continue the action, um, and to put our heads together. Um, and one thing that I have learned is um, it, it's not just the Indigenous peoples that are the leaders in this work, it's all of us that, you know, uh, leader, leadership groups such as RNAO and others uh, bring their gifts of leadership, but it is the nuance of the roles of who is collaborator and who is the leader in various uh, in our work together um, that we hope to um, provide a clear message about today. Um, and also it's very important to clearly delineate um, the nuance uh, of regional leadership and national leadership in our reconciliation path forward. Um, so thank you once again. So um, what I'm seeing on the slide then is the UNDRIP slide that uh, Lisa referred to. And for those of you who have not been, you know, are kind of just gaining some exposure to some of these international instruments um, and that policy level of this work, um, this is the critical piece of systemic reform in this country that is required um, to continue the work to address health inequity. Um, it is the structural impediments and barriers um, that we now need to tackle. And this will be and has been acknowledged uh, by the Truth and Reconciliation Report and its commissioners. This is the biggest challenge, is how to implement this um, amidst uh, legislative um, and other um, barriers related to our, our structures in health in this example and in education um, that prevent us from moving forward. So this is the greatest challenge. Uh, what we are fortunate to have is that through instruments such as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which represents 20 plus years of Indigenous peoples across the country coming together to talk about structural impediments and how we can have more authentic engagement. Um, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Canada was at that table. Um, and that document has informed the TRC. Secondly, 
that the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, which celebrated 20 years um, this past fall, also informs the PRC. That is a Canadian, um, you know, document that uh, the TRC Commission drew from as well. So we have lots of information as to how to move forward, but it is addressing the systemic barriers um, that we have to uh, focus on. So from a policy level, um, the cultural competency, the cultural safety, the need for curricula, uh, some of the things that were mentioned by my colleague, um, that is ongoing work. Um, but for folks, for our partners um, in the policy-related area, um, this is the critical um, collaborative work that we can engage on together. Um, so I just forgot that I'm supposed to advance the slide. I'm going to do that now. And so uh, what you see there then is a few bullets on this concept of authentic Indigenous partnership. Um, and essentially, um, Partnership with Indigenous peoples, whether it's at the community, the regional, or the national level, is grounded in, in a very diverse um, Indigenous philosophies. So as many of you already know, if you're working with various communities, there isn't a template that works for all, and it's similar at the regional and the national level. We engaged in this process of um, raising awareness and informing our regional partners because our work focuses mainly at the national level. Um, we know it's different for nurses working in the regions, and we applaud their efforts to deal with various um, regulatory bodies and associations to affect change at that local level. But the common values um, are critically important. We need to center relationality, respect, and reciprocity at the core of self-determination. So, again, you know, while uh, Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association holds a wealth of unique nursing knowledge related to Indigenous health. We recognize that organizations, in this case the RNAO, hold expertise in working within legislative frameworks related to nursing in this province, for example. So we offer each other, um, you know, something equal, and there is the value of reciprocity in relationships. So the UN has addressed an urgent need to respect and promote the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples. And, you know, in Canada, this is in our legislation, it's in our Canadian Constitution. And so the notion of authentic Indigenous partnership is grounded um, in this larger <coughs> international context. Excuse me. And so, as Lisa mentioned, Sina is engaged in a strategic plan that focuses and centers around this notion of authentic Indigenous partnership. And our intent is to engage collegial, <coughs> national, provincial, and local nursing partners. We also hope to engage with private sector partners. And this has been our course throughout the 40 plus years that we've been in operation. <coughs> However, Partnership has often been based on what the priorities are, for example, the provincial government or the federal government, or we're asked to collaborate on initiatives that other organizations have determined is their response to addressing health inequities for FNIM. We can not be at the table, so we respond in the best way we can. <clears throat> but oftentimes what happens is our own priorities get set aside in order to do that work. And this is our attempt to both, you know, acknowledge the authenticity of partnership work and to also move our own agenda forward. Um, so we have focused on our nursing policy, research practice, and education goals. Um, it is a strong relational approach. <clears throat> we will always have members. Something's happening to my throat, just a moment. <clears throat> Um, I've discovered that having a four-year-old grandchild who's just in school means I have to go through the whole immunocompromised situation as a grandparent. <laughs> um, so I'm just getting over a slow throat. <clears throat> so, so I've already mentioned um, that our, our framework uh, reflects the spirit and intent of UNDRIP and the PRC and that we cannot engage in this work without our allies. Um, so. We acknowledge the many years of experience and that the heart of our organization is about our members. 
So in the field, <clears throat> the local, community, regional level, are Indigenous nurses with many, many years of unique nursing knowledge that reflects an Indigenous worldview. Um, we've been leaders in articulating concepts related to cultural safety and competency, as Lisa was saying, and we aspire to the notion of by and with Indigenous people. Um, I'm going to skip the next slide in the interest of time about how we engage. This is part of of our foundational um, organizational documentation of how we will engage. So this continues to be relevant within this authentic partnership uh, process. Um, and again, it reflects the self-determining aspect of um, engaging Aboriginal people in decision-making of their health care. So we will continue to prioritize partnerships that are in alignment with our strategic plan objectives and member services and support is critical. This is oftentimes um, criticism that we receive is around our need to beef up members and so forth. Um, as Lisa mentioned in an earlier slide, uh, one of our partners identified over 7,000 Aboriginal nurses. Um, we, we need to continue to work in this area, but we also need capacity to support our member services. Um, and to inform our collaboration with others through Indigenous nursing knowledge, which is at the heart of um, the authentic partnership. And so we see the work of our members as a doorway to Indigenous communities, and, and this is not new. Community health nurses are often asked to participate in various tables, often at a disadvantage, working off the side of their desk because of their heavy clinical commitment. Uh, but they are acknowledged for their expertise. Um, we recognize our Indigenous nurses as stewards of INK or Indigenous nursing knowledge within their practice, and we thread that awareness through four priority areas of collaboration, which includes education, research, policy, and practice. And so this next slide is a visual that kind of pulls together um, the uh, concept with Indigenous nursing knowledge at the center are four areas of um, policy, standards, education, and research um, around the wheel and informed by, uh, in the northern direction, principles of authentic partnership, um, policy, um, and protocols. Um, So in terms of partnership objectives in the area of policy, and I think this is a critical one, as I mentioned earlier, in thinking about our collaboration with organizations such as um, RNAO. So, you know, the focus over the past 15 years has been at the applied level, helping health professionals uh, who work with Indigenous populations to understand what cultural competency, cultural safety, how to affect changes in curriculum and so forth. But this next piece, as I mentioned, around success, systemic reform is critical. And our nursing leaders, um, policy and decision makers, um, they need support as well. We need practical um, instruments, tools, um, advice and protocols uh, to, so that we can advance the reform in the best way possible. Um, what will happen in this era of TRC is we, we are at risk of repeating the same old, and that is that various initiatives creep up, um, you know, you may be informed by various Indigenous individuals or groups, um, but do not have a strong, in this case, Indigenous nursing knowledge leadership at the core. And I want to refer to, just back for a minute, to the question around cultural safety and trying to understand more about a reconciliation path forward. What is now, what we are now in the next phase of understanding cultural safety concepts and cultural competency is the notion of racism in healthcare. Um, there's been an excellent document release um, two years ago that's on the Wellesley Institute website um, called First Nations Second Class Treatment and it's authored by Dr. Janet Smiley and Dr. Billy Allen and it's gaining a lot of traction in the Indigenous health community in understanding equity because there is still a measure of systemic racism um, in the health area. 
Um, and that is not that is not talked about. Um, and in fact, some critics of the of the concept of cultural safety acknowledge um, it is lacking because of that. And so we need to understand that, have conversations about it, and we need to address it head on. And that that you know an area of policy reform that needs to be um, um, taken up. Um, so that's just one example. Um, but overall, our aim is to advance. Indigenous nursing policy and to work with our partners to do that at all levels. Um, we need to facilitate the Indigenous nursing voice. So this has been, this kind of format has been um, formally adopted by CNA, as you can see there. Um, and so we, we aspire to have partnership um, policy changes that are grounded in an Indigenous worldview and a rights-based framework. And if you look at various articles within UNDRA, this means that it's Indigenous voices that are at the table for um, important policy shifts and leadership um, collaboration, because to not do that is to risk then re uh, repeating past mistakes. Um, we want to form partnership with policymakers ourselves. We want to be at the table. Um, you know, we want to have input at the front end uh, around nursing policy and education. Uh, we want to, again, um, increase capacity and support for Indigenous experts and researchers. So, you know, many folks who have uh, multi-year multi experience in this area are called upon again and again, often, you know, working on this off the side of the desk, as I mentioned, with a double caseload and not being paid for their work. Um, so this is the mind mining um, that Lisa referred to. So it's trying to figure out how to have a balance in um, engagement and ensuring um, leadership in those roles. Um, so in terms, oh, so I just wanted to go back uh, to that once more and say that um, an example of working with a national uh, nursing policy uh, project is our work with the Canadian Nurses Association of Canada. So, um, sorry, I guess it's CNA, not of Canada. And uh, so we signed a partnership accord with them last year, um, which was, you know, really reflected over 20 years of partnership with CNA and um, CNA. Um, the next challenge, of course, becomes how to implement uh, a, a work plan that reflects the values of authentic Indigenous partnership. And, you know, we're in the, we're in the midst now of the next phase, which is to develop a joint work plan. Um, but even, even the mechanics of a work plan require both partners, you know, to take roles in some cases, you know, will be the collaborator um, as you know, CNA provides expertise of being a national network. They will be a collaborator versus a leader in the Indigenous nursing knowledge. And so working together in a new way takes time and careful deliberation, and that's uh, the process that we're in now. So it's a learning experience for everybody that I think um, can serve as a template for other organizations um, addressing uh, nursing policy uh, or educational reform. So in the practice area, um, you'll see here from both from our original draft and input that we've had from other webinars and other um, events, um, that the professional role continues to evolve based on the settings and context. So we know that, you know, everybody is dealing with various issues and there's quite diverse uh, issues there. Um, that Indigenous nursing knowledge is at the core. And clearly articulating what that means. So, you know, is it just Indigenous nurses who have Indigenous nursing knowledge, or do we also have to make room for non-Indigenous nurses who have been working with Indigenous communities for most of their career? What does, you know, so what exactly does that mean, or, you know, how, what's the nuance in that? As I mentioned, the identification of structural barriers and solutions. Um, you know, so nurses who are wanting to introduce traditional knowledge or traditional healing um, collaborations into their practice. Uh, what are the barriers for them doing that at the community level? Um, there's a lot of fear around that, a lot of unknowns, and there's not a lot of room in legislation um, or accreditation 
uh, for traditional healing. So that to me is like the next frontier that we all have to deal with. Um, connecting with regulatory bodies to make sure that those systemic changes are made that support these kinds of work and harmonizing traditional healing and um, Western knowledge. Um, so I won't go through each bullet point, but I'll just highlight a few. So in the areas of education then, um, support and education of our nursing students remains a critically important objective. Um, you know, we've had witness to a lot of systemic reform um, and partnership uh, with our Canadian Nursing Students Association that have come out very strong in support of Indigenous nursing and um, making structural changes with their partners to support that. We're very proud of the work that they have been doing. Um, we'd also uh, continue to partner with our nursing educators. As Lisa mentioned, we've done a lot of work with COSM in the past and we'll continue um, to look at um, new ways in this reconciliation path forward. Um, we also, you know, there's a, a huge interest of schools of nursing to, for those who currently have nursing, uh, Indigenous health curricula in their, in their uh, programs, to those who are just starting down that path, um, you know, how do we support um, various schools um, in this um, in this area? <clears throat> in terms of research, this again is closely tied to uh, you know self reflection and the practice um, domain. Um, we have to acknowledge and explore the ontological and epistemological differences between Indigenous knowledge and traditional biomedical knowledge. Um, we have to figure out ways to continue the work that's been started by our um, Indigenous research co uh, colleagues uh, around the world. Uh, we've made great headway here in Canada uh, with a lot of systemic reform, but there's been a few steps backwards in the last couple of years uh, with lots of funding um, and um, systemic changes for the Institute of Aboriginal People's Health, FCIHR, for example. So we need to continue to uh, move that work forward. Um, and nursing research is um, around Indigenous health is very strong at the moment. Um, so we need to also look at um, a post-colonial perspective within nursing education, and again, as I mentioned earlier, understand more about racism in healthcare. And we also need uh, to adapt a national ethical framework for decision making, and increase support and capacity for Indigenous nurse researchers. So here's kind of getting to the meat of the matter, um, and again. Um, as we all reflect and consider the calls to action, um, you know, the questions are now being asked, well, how do we go about it? And the implementation of the TRC calls is the biggest challenge as acknowledged by in the report. Um, so, you know, a lot of what we are able to do is, again, going to be um, guided by the systemic reform legislative changes that need to be made that will trickle on down to uh, various institutions and educational bodies. Um, so we need to have those conversations. Um, and, you know, again, uh, as, an, as our organization has identified key partners in this work. Um, so, it, you know, we, again, we have instruments that can guide us. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think what you see highlighted on your screen is nothing for us without us. And, um, you know, that's kind of a mantra to keep in mind. Um, I often, from my experience in working at both the regional and the national level of uh, nursing policy, um, we're often invited to the table um, as things have been preliminary, even if it's a preliminary process, have been thought out. Um, the other situation is we're invited to the table and invest a lot of time and energy and resources um, to see that our voices are still somewhat marginalized in the final outcome. Um, so that's a hard truth that has to be addressed. 
And, uh, you know, we believe that protocols and uh, instruments such as memorandums of understanding, partnership agreements, um, protocols for establishing the partnership can assist all of us in creating ways of uh, authentic partnership. Uh, but these are some of the principles that you see here. So it is a reconciliation approach. It is recognizing that there are many well-intentioned initiatives and um, activities that, that happen that seem to reflect uh, good intentions by our partners, but actually marginalize our voice. Um, so when we are not included in a process, um, it perpetuates that situation. Um, I mentioned before principles of relationality, reciprocity, um, standards of excellence, equity and respect. Um, and also, um, there's a huge learning curve for our, our colleagues and our allies, and that is knowing uh, about the socio-historical context uh, in all areas. Um, and so what I mean by that, like right now I'm aware that there are 62 online resources in Ontario alone about the history of Indigenous peoples in this country. Um, so, you know, there are excellent resources to tap into. And um, SENA has a lot of publications and online education is another project that we're engaging in. Um, but our leaders, our policymakers have to educate themselves as well. Um, I have worked with and in, been involved in activities where at the highest level of the federal government, um, there are leaders and decision makers who are still not aware of what happened in this country. Um, the TRC has changed that. Um, it's created a window of opportunity and, and given us all permission to say, I didn't know that this happened this way. And that's okay because it was part of an assimilative agenda. Um, but, you know, we have now set the bar high that we need to learn more um, in order to influence our work um, in a way that's going to create true change. So the education, and, and it's not up to Indigenous people to educate everybody. It's up, for, it's up to our, our policy leaders and, our, you know, our nurses, our educators to educate themselves. Uh, we can be at the table for the conversations, um, but that is, that's part of your homework. Um, so uh, those are some guiding principles. And then, you know, as I said, the regional and local level, there will be others. Protocols, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is important for uh, recognizing diversity. Um, organizations have different cultures and ways of working together. Um, but as these start to emerge and we test them out, um, there will be templates to share. And certainly, Sina can see a role for ourselves in this regard. I mentioned the partnership accords or agreements. We need to clearly articulate governance and authority parameters of the relationship and the scope of the activities that people will partner in. There's not a need for everybody to do the same thing. There's a need to clearly articulate who's doing what and how we will do it. Um, that becomes a challenge in a policy and funding environment that sometimes pits organizations, you know, scrambling for the same resources. Um, so, you know, we have, to, we have to address that. We have to learn to work in a different way. And so finally, in terms of the next steps, um, you know, this is our third webinar. Um, we have one more regional one um, that we hope to do either in the north or in the west. And um, we've been documenting um, people's feedback and also encouraging people um, that may not be able to participate in the webinar. You can spread the word that, um, you know, they can respond by calling us or by email, um, the document's up on the website um, and so forth. We're also, um, you know, can, can be speakers at um, broad network events to help spread the word that way as well. Um, and so, um, I think I will stop there and uh, open up the floor for questions and discussion. Okay. Thank you, Bernice. Uh, I've received a few comments during the presentation, which I can read out on the line now. Uh, so one question that a great resource you provided, thank you. I'll be passing that around to my coordinators. 
Um, someone else asked for the link to the SENA cultural competencies. So maybe if um, if you can send that to me, I can forward it to the participants. Yeah, um, I just like to acknowledge that, um, that that document is online on the SENA website, but there is a, a, a small charge for the document. Um, if that's a barrier for some people, it, it's also on the COSN website um, without a fee. So I know that's <laughs> very good salesmanship, but in the interest of people having access to the information, uh, that's another way to access the document. Oh, okay, great. And on the COSM website, uh, if you just search for uh, SENA cultural competencies, would it come up? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so another comment is, uh, hello, in Ontario Health, we are offering a foundational ICS online program. It's co-facilitated and interactive, designed to assist healthcare professionals to disrupt the unexamined biases that interfere with good practice and they provide a link. Um, it is based on the Sanyas program developed in BC. I think it's helpful to distinguish between learning about cultures and helping people to do deep reflection on their own cultures and thinking about how colonial beliefs are embedded into healthcare. Um, yeah, I think that's a, an excellent uh, comment to share with the group. Um, I think that some of these resources that are you know, and initiatives that are expanding on the concept of cultural safety, self-reflection, um, you know, are in keeping with the kind of a reconciliation path forward. Um, I also have a couple of comments that have come to me privately. So um, just, you know, acknowledging, um, for instance, one person um, asked the question, would having school champions for SENA help support the curriculum at nursing schools across Ontario. Um, I think that's a great idea. And, you know, the notion of allyship or champions um, in the reconciliation path forward is critical. So as I mentioned, there's, you know, we can't, Indigenous people can't do this alone. So in every avenue, uh, it requires support from our allies. Um, and that, that's, that's a very, uh, you know, useful suggestion. Um, to think about in our collaboration with COSM and so forth. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> someone else asks about uh, a research project that happened uh, here at McMaster University. It was a development of an Indigenous undergraduate summer research scholars program. Um, and uh, an individual participant said that it was influential and meaningful to them as an Indigenous nurse. Uh, and so they were suggesting or asking if there's opportunities available with SENA. Not at this time, um, but if people are interested in that program, and I'm also aware that um, the University of Winnipeg has uh, adopted this same pro in undergraduate research program. So you can go to our website at McMaster to find out more about it. Um, we don't have the capacity to take on a program like that right now, but certainly something to think about for the future. Okay, uh, Bernice, would you like me to read the next two comments? Um, or to, if there's somebody that wants to say something online. Oh yeah, sure, let me just unmute the line then. Okay. The conference has been unmuted. Le mode discrétion a été enlevé de la conférence. So I guess from a regional perspective, let's bring it here again. Um, here in Ontario, um, you know, what is the, what do people think about this notion of authentic partnership and, you know, what does it mean, you know, folks out in the audience working in this area of policy, education, research, or practice, uh, even your own reflections on the concept would be useful to hear about too.
This is Lisa Bernice, and just while people are maybe thinking about their responses, just to, you know, uh, add to that question about um, authentic. When when you were posing that question, something that I I think about is what is the meaning of support? Because um, I just think historically the support that seen has been provided um, and the support that seen is um, exchanged with other organization and the benefits of that. So when I think about authentic partnerships, for me it's that reciprocity piece. I, I think about significantly is that this organization continues to do, you know, work in this area, but the system is created where we necessarily can't work within, within an authentic framework because the system is created now for us to compete with other national organizations for funding. And, you know, and I, you know, I hate to take it there, but my experience with looking at authentic Indigenous engagement, two questions come up regarding that reciprocity, and it's that human um, human resources to be able to do this work, and then the financial commitment. So, um, I just want, I, I've been dying to put this out there, and you can you know me, and I, I put this question, been putting it out there at almost every conversation I have is that when we talk about equity, what does that look like? For SENA to be able to continue to do this work and to work in collaboration with our regions, we need to think smarter and we need to think about how do we align ourselves with our regional bodies so that there is a sustainability commitment investment to SENA so that we can make sure this organization stays around for another 40 years. I think the knowledge would be an, an immediate outcome of that relationship with with other organizations, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear what regional members think about the idea about, you know, one of the biggest things that we've been up against is sustainability. So if we're going to continue to do this work on authentic Indigenous engagement, do we do continue to do it out of the kindness of our hearts and share all this information, or do we come up with some some working agreements about financial support, right? Um, and so, would people in in the Ontario region support uh, the funneling of funds to an Indigenous health agenda that could maybe be used to support SENA over long term? Yeah, um, so Lisa, that, uh, I also wanted to add to that. Um, so I just wanted to share a little story, because um, I always read silence in these kinds of things as uh, not that people aren't interested or have something to say, but oftentimes people are just shy or fearful of saying the wrong thing, except for the person who's talking in the background constantly. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so maybe you can mute the line again, uh, Joe, because I can't hear myself. Okay, sure. Just give me one second. I remember the very first guy. The conference has been muted. La conférence a été mise en mode discrétion. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so I just wanted to share this quick story. So um, I was involved in the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. We had a Canadian reference group. Uh, myself and Margot Greenwood from the National Collaborating Center on Aboriginal Health were participated. And um, it, there was a, uh, I think it was the CNA biennium meeting um, out in the East Coast there a few years back. And we had a special day on social determinants of health. And there was representatives from many, you know, lead organizations and so forth. But it was a smaller invitation only. So there was a small panel, I was one of the panel speakers, and the idea was to break out into these groups of identified um, uh, focus. And so one of them was Indigenous health. And so we were talking, you know, about inequities, you know, social determinants, what did it all mean? And how would these nursing leaders, um, you know, uh, what could we do to address these various area foci? So as people, 
stood up to disperse to the various tables, and it was their choice. I watched people. In the end, when everyone sat down, there was nobody sitting at the Indigenous health table, except for one Indigenous participant. <laughs> and so I, I just calmly went to the mic, and I, and I pointed it out. And so even some of the FNIB representatives that were there had not gone to the table. Of course, everybody turned around, and everyone was horrified that there was nobody sitting at the Indigenous health table. And so a few people ran over, and we finally got a group. And I sat in that group, and basically for the whole session, what we did was we, we had a conversation about why that happened. And what we came up with and reported back to the group is that there is a general sense at all levels, in all domains, of we don't know what to say, how to say it. Um, you know, we want to yield to Indigenous leadership, voice, and experience. So, you know, I think it has almost become a fear of being politically incorrect um, or, in, you know, unintentionally offending. Um, but what was so useful about that hour that we had together was just to have the conversation. So we did it in a traditional circle. Everyone had an opportunity to say how they felt, started from a place of reflection, it allowed us to move forward. And even though we didn't address the objective of that meeting, it was such a useful exercise, and it, and it demonstrated to me that there are a lot of well-intentioned in, allies and champions out there without a lexicon, without the protocols, without knowing how to do this. So in those silences that I hear, I know people are thinking very carefully um, and feeling that they need more education. Just start there. Start having a conversation with folks in your region or with your organizations or amongst your colleagues, how do we move forward in this, in this time of reconciliation nursing? Um, there's a question there that I'll tackle uh, and Lisa, you may want to jump in. So it says, uh, are there things that we can do to make our existing partnerships with Indigenous leaders more authentic? Um, yes. Um, I think that wherever partnership exists, you're already ahead of the game because you're already working together. The partnership may not be perfect, um, but that's what good partnership is all about in any context, I think, is you learn and you, as you're working together. Um, but I think what's critically important is, um, you know, where there's tensions or, um, you know, where there's opportunity to enhance the partnership is now to take the time and educate all members of that partnership about the TRC um, and about the articles relating to uh, Indigenous people's rights to self-determine um, their organizations, um, the way they want to work together, and, and reflect on what you're doing. Uh, where are you meeting the mark? Where is there room for improvement? Um, you know, how, you know, another area of focus is how do we infuse our partnership with more emphasis on Indigenous nursing knowledge? What is traditional healing? What is Indigenous knowledge? Um, you know, can we, can we raise the bar to make room for that in all of our domains? Um, so those are a few suggestions. Um, Bernice, I think Lisa wants to add something, so I'll just unmute the line. Uh -huh. Just a reminder to everyone, please uh, just try to minimize the noise on your line. The conference has been unmuted. Le mode discrétion a été enlevé de la conférence. Hi, Lisa, are you there? Yes, I am. No, okay, um, I, oh, I, I just put it on on the chat thing, but I, you know, I just being mindful of um, what um, Bernice was sharing there, you know. This is tough work, and it's it's hard to have these tough conversations. I was just in class teaching a, a group of first year nursing students last week, and um, it was really difficult for them to bring forth 
and to feel safe and to talk about their own personal assumptions and biases. Um, so, you know, um, these are tough conversations and so creating that space where we can, so it's, you know, it's putting our judgments aside. So, yeah, it's tough work, but, you know, all I can say is that I think we're definitely in, a, in an era now where we can create these tough conversations and really critically un unpack nursing and give people an opportunity to expose their myths and assumptions, right? That's, it's tough work and I know um, just from that experience last week, I was really taken back um, with, with the discussion in class and it kind of like shook me to the core because I thought these are first year nursing students and they're very strong in their views, right? Um, but once I got over that initial shock of some of the statements, I think we then further engaged in, you know, a very therapeutic conversation and it was really eye-opener for some of those uh, students to walk away and just, you know, thinking about it a little bit differently. And, and that's one of the things that I think about the word Indigenous, right? When you look at the meaning of that word, it, it basically means that we come from the land. So that's why I appreciate that word because it, it doesn't support this colonial ideal with the term Aboriginal or even First Nations, Inuit, Métis people. That, you know, as nurses, we've got to critically unpack the language we're using because if we're choosing to continue to wor use words like reserve and, you know, um, First Nations, Inuit or Aboriginal, w then we, we buy into this colonial ideal that this is how we identify people, whereas a lot of our Indigenous communities and I families are reclaiming their own traditional names. Um, so that's that's really important, tough work for nurses, but you know, nursing is skilled in these areas to be able to have these conversations. So we're skilled in working collaboratively with with different disciplines and professions. So, you know, that's why I'm a very strong advocate for nursing leadership in this area to to um, create these conversations and, and facilitate these very deep discussions because we're all Indigenous from somewhere, right? Um, so that word helps me not to separate people and when I think about our communities too, um, just the language we use in nursing really needs to be unpacked. Uh, just in response to that, Lisa, uh, one of the participants um, said that her local Indigenous colleagues have asked her to use the terms First Nations, um, Inuit, and Métis. So she's a bit confused about what the proper terminology is. Well, you know, um, I think, um, you know, when we look at the history of colonization and the, um, the influence of the Indian Act, which still currently is in place, it definitely articulates ways that our communities should function. And it's clearly in there that um, they identify as First Nations Inuit Métis people. So in the colonial ideal, if, if First Nations communities are wanting uh, their nurses to refer to them than that, then I would respect that, right? I know other communities, there's this other big shift. And we're in the midst of the shift. That's why, you know, there is no right word. It really depends on where your community's at. Um, in terms of how they want to self-identify. I know here in BC and Alberta, um, our communities are reclaiming their names. So now when I do any kind of communication or talking with the community, they want me to use their traditional name, which is Tukumlups Tishwetmak Ulu, right? Which represents 17 different, but when I work individually with the community, they want me to specifically use their name, such as Simp. Now that's added a whole lot of um, extra work on my part because it's it's been a whole new learning knowledge, right? I've had to learn about the local people. I've had to engage, and you know, and our systems of nursing don't really allow us the time to do that work. So, um, again, if, if that's what their community is is wanting them to say or call them, then you know, I would respect that. But I'm mindful of the reserve mentality and how we've legislated Indigenous identity, identities, right? Um, that Constitution Act of 1982 
was really implemented with very little impact and consent from our Indigenous communities. So as some of our Indigenous communities come to terms with their own colonial history, right, this is what we're seeing, you know, 150 years um, of resistance and resilience really going to be showing itself over the next year with Canada's celebration, right? Yeah, I would I just uh, I would just add to that that um, I mean what I primarily see is the term indigenous is used from an academic perspective, um, you know, in, in the in the current writing and research and academia and so forth. Um, I find that organizations uh, typically refer to their con you know their constituency group, whether it's First Nations, Inuit, or Métis, um, and you know, when you're referring in writing or working with Aboriginal organizations. So there really is kind of a very broad, you know, uh, way, uh, use of definitions. Um, and the document that I mentioned earlier about racism in health, um, that's down, you can download for free from the Wellesley Institute website, First Nations Second Class Treatment, um, on page seven. There's a, a fantastic explanation of how to use various terminology, um, you know, as, as we've just discussed. Uh, getting back to, uh, this is Liz speaking from Ottawa. Um, I just thought I would break the silence. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, thinking about the discussions that Lisa mentioned in her classroom uh, with the first year students, it would be really helpful for, I know, educators to have some case studies, some questions. Uh, presumably, I haven't looked at your framework, but um, maybe there are discussions around that. Maybe someone could explain that to me. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, can you just clarify a bit further? Well, uh, uh, Lisa was saying in her classroom she had a discussion with her first year students around Indigenous people and their history and thing, and, and it seemed to be difficult at first to get them talking, and then a lot of things came out. Well, what kinds of questions, or how did she encourage that, or what did they, did they read something first and work in small groups, or did she ask questions from the whole class, or what approach did, did she use? Actually, I'll, I, it actually came about accidentally um, in a quiz that I, I give weekly quizzes just to see if students are following the readings. So in the quiz, I actually used um, an indigenous, uh, an abstract by an indigenous scholar, and I didn't put any names on that. But the, anyways, when when it came time to reviewing the quiz, that's when the comments came out about why are we still dwelling, you know, on indigenous issues? Why are indigenous people oppressed? You know, you know, indigenous people do this to themselves. And this was as a result of just having that example of that abs that indigenous abstract on that quiz. And it was quite interesting because the week before, when I gave them abstracts of other qualitative and quantitative research examples, there wasn't those value judgments made with those abstracts. So it really came out with the integration of that um, indigenous abstract. Um, and so then what I, what I had to do is then I pulled out, TRU is very, um, has a very strong policy at a very high level, the TRU is very clear, Thompson River, about um, Indigenous education. So I use that as my stepping stone to say, okay, so what I hear you saying, and you know, it was, it was just reassuring the students that this was a very important conversation and this was a safe place, and so let's put some of these myths on the table. And so, you know, the traditional ones came. There was definitely a belief that 
Indigenous people are very privileged because we get free education. So we spent half an hour unpacking that and what that really meant. Then we spent a half an hour unpacking why it was important for the students to be able to know that this was to come loop the Shwet Makulu Nation, right? And so why can't we just treat everybody the same? So that brought us into a discussion on the difference between equity and equality, right? So um, it's, it's just having, you know, um, creating that safe space so people don't feel judged. And my first reaction was like, and I heard those very strong comments, I was really taken back. I thought, wow. Like these are just coming out. Before for okay, me, so it was you're saying it was incidental. I I had felt that there was a say a determinants of health class or something like that, and you, Actually, yeah, and you and, used and so, that as. Well, what I did the next week was this is a knowledge nursing knowledge course I teach, so the next week's class was on ways of knowing. So what I did was I incorporated indigenous ways of knowing as one of the cardinal ways of knowing because we're on this nation and this territory. So it gave me that way in to now bring into nursing practice other ways of knowing, such as indigenous ways of knowing. And that conversation the second week was very phenomenal, like to see the change in students thinking about the importance of integrating Indigenous ways of knowing in a knowledge theory class, right, was um, very fruitful. Yeah, well, then yeah. that's that's consistent with um, education, like, and you introduce them something and apply it to something that's that's of, of value, and then uh, then add to it. And I, in my research, and this was to do with women's consciousness raising, uh, one week I got statements about, oh, we're much better now, our daughters don't have any problems, da, 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 da. The week following, they came back with all, they had thought about it, yeah. and they came back with their examples of how things are still different, and girls do yeah. still struggle. So, but yeah. I, I, I think it would be useful to work on some sort of resource package to initiate the kinds of discussions that need to happen and that could be used in a curriculum. Well, and yeah, that's, that's what that I put to that framework, framework again. Yeah. Um, the CNA framework has those six indicators with um, a, a student objectives to achieve. So for me, that's been a great starting point to integrate that framework into the classes that I teach. It also and I pretty much the other um, the other question is you know again following the TRC and the focus on indigenizing the academy um, you know various institutions are at different starting points so you know I mean TRU is so fortunate to have Lisa um, because she can influence you know the curricula the the agenda there and so forth but. There's many non-Indigenous educators who, working in schools of nursing, who, yeah. you know, want, need resources. Um, so we're looking for, you know, broader network kind of support. And so one of the projects that Cena is embarking on is a collaboration with the Canadian Council on Universities, um, the schools of nursing. There's a working group there that's looking at understanding what are the needs across uh, universities in Ontario around uh, nursing curricula and Indigenous health. So, you know, we need to continue to develop that work and, there's, you know, and, and not leave our, both our Indigenous and our non-Indigenous uh, nursing educators holding the bag. Very challenging work. So I'm looking yeah, at and the just time. To, and, just to, and just to support that statement, Bernice, um, the Canadian Association of uh, University of Teachers uh, will be releasing their position statement on Indigenous education um, for all um, academic, ins all, all educational institutions. So um, I'll, I'll um, so that will be coming out probably in the next week or so. so. If you don't know who Kaut is, um, watch for that statement. That will give us give people guide, good guidelines on on where to start.
Um, so I'm just looking at the time. Um, I think we're, we're about to wrap up, no? I wonder, I heard somebody um, make a comment. I wonder if I cut somebody off by accident. I'm sorry. I think that might have been me. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, Bernice. <laughs> We're just talking amongst ourselves. <laughs> um, is there any other burning comments or questions, I guess? Do you have a uh, do you have a list of people and their um, uh, that have talked today and their contact information, or we would just go through the um, the, uh, the uh, website, the Cena website? Um, yeah, uh, well, the Cena website has like I'm I'm the uh, board member for Ontario Quebec region, um, and Lisa is the current president. So you can reach us through the CENA website, but I'll just post my uh, email address here as well at McMaster um, if other people want to, to reach me. Um. Oh, it's got a funny little thing below your name, so I... <laughs> can you see it? I'm just trying to see if I can. I sent it to all attendees. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, you know, we're we're open to, you know, answering other questions, sharing the framework, uh, you know, people people want to get together and discuss it as a group and send us feedback. We you know, it it'll be an iterative um document. Thanks so much for all your work on this, Bernice. Um I know you've invested a lot of your a service time to this, so you know. And I, I keep asking this question, and I, I, people are reluctant to answer this, but I really, really need to keep asking it. And I think um, maybe people just need to, to think more about it. About what's, the, what are some of the activities we can do to sustain Cena? Are would people be willing to? share some of their registration fees so that we say $5 from every nurse across Canada goes to, to building and sustaining SENA. For me, that's a really important question for sustainability and and um, for our future. So I just, I'm going to leave that question out there. I know it's a tough one. Well, it's also a consciousness raising one. <laughs> Put your money where your face is. But I, I also, I think another possibility of a resource is to develop resources from where you people are because you can't be everywhere that can be used uh, in education and that I know you'd have to sell them and that creates problems, but it would be another form of getting resources. Well, and we've, we've tried that strategy for a number of years and it's, it hasn't been effective, right? Somehow the message isn't getting out. I, I I didn't. I wasn't even aware of your framework, so I'm, I'm oh, embarrassed okay. about that. <laughs> yeah, somebody is asking a question about uh, can allies join Cena? Yes, we have regular membership, associate membership, and student membership. So you don't have to be of Indigenous heritage to be a member. Um, you know, you can be from an organization, you can be a non-Indigenous nurse, you can be from the general public if you wanted to be, uh, but it has implications on your ability to vote in certain things, and that information is on, on, the, uh, on the website. Lisa and um, Bernice, it's Lynn I'm I just have a little question, if you don't mind, is you were mentioning the National Ethical Framework for Decision Making. Is that a CENA project that you're working on? Um, I'm trying to think where that was mentioned. No, we're, we're not working on an ethical framework. Um, I think, I think that might have come, came up in the discussion around perhaps, uh, Lisa, what you were discussing around, um, or the research slide. I think in the research slide, 
Um, or I was thinking maybe it was misunderstood as authentic framework. Yeah, yeah, there is a new, like there, uh, can, uh, Canadian Indigenous researchers have been working with international colleagues uh, around the area of reform around research ethics that are, you know, within an Indigenous context, reflect Indigenous values and research and methodologies, for example. So there is, there's been work, ongoing work. Um, the, the framework, this framework is, a, is about partnership and collaboration in a self-determining context, um, okay. but certainly encompasses ethics, yeah. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Okay, so uh, in, in wrapping up, it's, it's Daniel Lau again, yes. Uh, I'd like you to, to join and support our uh, respective organization, SENA, and the uh, contact information is on the last slide. Uh, and for colleagues who want to be part of the strong voice to shape healthy public policy and are not a member of RNAO, I would invite you to sign up on the website today at rnao.ca slash join, uh, the 1-800-268-7199 for questions. Uh, thank you so much to everybody. Can I just add a, one more thing here? Yeah. I just I should have I should have mentioned it earlier. Um, Cena is having um, hosting a workshop in Ottawa, February 24th. Um, you can sign up on our website, uh, and we're looking. Uh, we'll be addressing this topic again. Um, frame more within. Um, some of the other key concepts as we mentioned today as trauma-informed care and the ethical aspects of our partnership. So it'll be in Ottawa at Wabano Centre February 24th from 9 to 3 p.m. And then if we have any Indigenous nurses online, we are also hosting our AGM um, shortly thereafter on that day. So we'll be looking uh, positions up for um, nomination are the president, the president-elect, Ontario region is looking, um, will be looking for a new member. Um, uh, which one? Atlantic region, um, our student um, board seat. So we have a number of board positions that are up that have come to their two year term. So just if you're interested, all the information is on the website. And thank you so much, RNAO, for hosting this. And Bernice, thank you so much for all of your service to CNA over the years. I know you've been actively involved and contributed in so many different ways. And I look forward to this new RNAO partnership that we hopefully will extend and continue to collaborate on. Um, I'm, I'm just in awe with you know the fact that we were able to reach 100 people today. So. Congratulations, and with that, I just want to send you all off in a good way, um, and may the Creator bless each of you in your daily paths, and thank you for your work. Thank you thank very you, much. Sir. Thank you for the opportunity for us, Dina and RNAO, to have this joint webinar, working together to support Indigenous Partnership. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye, everyone.